Okay, let me see if I can answer a few of these great questions that came in. Uh, bring down the presence of God. What do we mean when we say that? Isn't God omnipresent? He's everywhere, which we know. And aren't we already filled with the Spirit? So, you know, that statement, the presence of God, Lord, your presence is welcome here. Uh, the more I seek you, the more I find you. You know, some of those songs may be, I'm a lover of your presence. So what, I mean, in the Old Testament, obviously, like when Moses said, I don't want to go if your presence doesn't go with me. And then we saw, obviously, in the temple, the Shekinah glory of God, his presence, which is a clear, clear uh, distinction that, that God is there. So although he's everywhere, omnipresent, there are special times, special moments where his his glory, his presence, his power is is thick and you can feel it, the weight of it. So now transfer, obviously, into the New Testament. We have the believers, I'm sorry, believers have the Holy Spirit representing, obviously, God's presence in us. But two key words with the Holy Spirit, quenching and grieving. So, um, and also, I think it was James or Peter, I don't have the, didn't look any scriptures up, that talked about, you know, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, a lot of scriptures like that tell me, well, there's a, there's a deeper relationship that can take place. There's a, there's a, uh, um, um, just a, a, I don't know if you want to call it presence, but just a, a heartfelt, uh, you know, feeling that God is there, God is with you. And then of course, reading, I love to read books on early church history, revival. And there are times where, you know, you have a boring church service. Okay. You know, it's good. Good word. We'll see you. Let's go to lunch. And there are times you don't want to leave the magnitude of sin is being proclaimed. People are weeping. God is breaking. He is restoring. He is renewing. He is reviving. Husbands are coming home, better fathers. The presence of God is there. And that's, that's revival. So, um, and obviously, you, you know, the disciples, I believe were Christians. And when Jesus breathed on them, the breath of air, uh, not the breath of air, sorry. When he said, um, you know, I, uh, I received the Holy Spirit and he breathed on them. And then later, you know, they received that mighty endowment of power from the Holy Spirit. Now, granted, we could say, well, we're all baptized in the Spirit, uh, into the Holy Spirit when we're believers, which is true. But there is a, um, what happens is I believe we have all of the Holy Spirit at conversion. But the question is, does he have all of us? So, um, and, and when we talk about, you know, well, it feels, it feels a little ex experiential, like you're experiencing God, but I mean, isn't that the point? I mean, of, of, of emotions, God has given us God given emotions to feel him and to understand him and to just, uh, just time with him. It's just incredible when, when God just fills you with the spirit and the emotions that follow. So I would think it would be exper experiential. You, you're experiencing God and that's clear throughout scripture, whether it was, you know, um, Isaiah saying, you know, woe is me, I'm unholy in the train of his robe, filled the temple to Jeremiah, to uh, Malachi and Ezekiel and Daniel and Joel. And then we get into the New Testament. And um, so that's what we mean. We God is everywhere, but there are special seasons where his manifest presence, I don't know how you want to define it, but his, his, his glory or his, his um, just that he is there. Maybe there's more of an, an awe of, of that. And um, what's happened over the years is a lot of people have quenched and grieved the spirit and they don't, they don't know that they're missing this, this, this deeper relationship. And that's why, you know, if you read books, one good book is they found the secret and it's not a, you know, it's got John Bunyan, Amy Carmichael, Hudson Taylor, Adonai Judson, you know, a lot of good Christians that came before us. And they talk about their experience with the Holy Spirit years after conversion where they were, you know, kind of just going through and going through the motions, love the word, but nothing, nothing real profound until they, they had this incredible encounter with God that came from full surrender. You know, I'm fully surrendering my life. I'm getting rid of pride, judgmentalism, bitterness, arrogance, um, fear, anxiety, judgmental spirit, um, you know, ongoing lust or, con you know, and, and they just fully surrender everything. Doesn't mean they're perfect. And then as a result, the more you surrender, the more you're filled. And so that's what I think, you know, Lord, would you, would you make it known that you're here tonight? Fill us with your glory, fill us with your presence. And of course, I guess on the wording, you know, it, it, it's, but again, it's all what a person would perceive the wording. You know, John MacArthur says God's presence, you know, okay, no big deal. Benny Hinn says God's presence. And, you know, we're going to think of different things there. Um, so we're not saying he is not present unless we feel it. We are simply asking for a 
deeper relationship with him and to come and impact the service in a pro- profound way, convict the sinner, encourage the saint. God begin to just Holy Spirit move in this place. And it's, it's all biblical. It's all thoroughly biblical um, because that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, Preachers and Preaching, uh, John MacArthur said it's one of his top 10 books. The last chapter, he talks about the endowment of power of the Holy Spirit, the uh, whatever you, what you want to call it, unction, the power, the baptism, the fullness you know, I'd rather, I think it was R.A. Torrey who said, I'd rather, I'd rather get the power of God and not, not quite get the term right than get the term right and miss the power. Now, of course, he's not talking, he's not dismissing theology. I love theology, but theology I read teaches me that we can have a deeper experience with God through the working of the Holy Spirit. So we're not saying it, um, we're not saying, Lord, you know, come here, we have to fill it or you're not present. We're, we're basically, it's a heart cry. It's a heart cry of, oh, God, please meet your people. Oh, God, would you come and revive us again like the prophet? Oh, God, would you rend the heavens and come down, come down and visit your people? Wait a minute. Wait, wait. God's everywhere. You know, so rend the heavens, come down, visit your people. Moses said, I don't even want to go if your presence doesn't go with me. So there's something tangible. There's something unique. There's something about the fullness of God's spirit in your life. So hope that helps on that one. Um, but I, yeah, I, I get you on the wording. You know, I, I always think, okay, what's somebody going to think about? You know, obviously his presence is here, but clearly, I mean, I've been in churches that are dead and I've been churches that are alive and on fire and it's, it's a no brainer. Now you could say, well, that's just emotions. Well, if the husband's going home a better father, you've got three alcoholics being broken, their stronghold of addiction. You've got demonic deliverance taking place. You've got uh, moms uh, who had postpartum and suicidal dep- thoughts being, being released to that. You've got marriages being restored. Uh, I'd say a lot more is going on than just emotion. So, you know, that's how we gauge it really by the fruit. Um, revival comes through preaching the word. Now, Yes and no. I don't know how many, how much you've read of revivals. I've read, you know, in the 1700s with Duncan Campbell and uh, not Duncan Campbell, uh, Hal Harris, Griffin Jones, um, Daniel Rollins of the Welsh revivals, the Calvinistic Methodist Fathers of Wales, two volume set, tons of revivals. I've got thick books on the revivals of Scotland, uh, Duncan Campbell in the 1950s or 40s, Evan Roberts, 1904, 1905. Um, just about every single revival I read about, believe it or not, is started by prayer and brokenness and humility. That is what sparks the revival. Now, granted, then you bring in preaching of the word, strong doctrine, a repentance of sin, and that just really keeps that revival going. Um, and we're not trying to make it happen, but like a farmer, we're tilling the soil. God would say, break up your fallow ground so you may receive, you know, the, 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 the blessings of God. And there's a, there's a deep work that happens in our spirit when we, when we till up that fallow ground. And so we know we can't make revival come down. We can't make it happen, but we sure can prepare our hearts. We can prepare the soil of our hearts. And God says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you till that soil and cry out, I will pour out into you the, the filling of my spirit. And so all this is, is to me, very thoroughly biblical. Uh, it, now it's not, everyone's used to it because we've become so comfortable. But, um, again, if you, if you download my short booklet, Oh God, rend the heavens. I talk a lot more about this and answer, actually answer your exact questions. Talk about, you know, these weird prophetic prophets, weird charismatics, you know, it's all in that book too. Uh, let's see, uh, long, uh, long songs that are trying to eke out emotion. Well, here's the thing about long songs. Um, we definitely don't say, okay, we have to go 10 minutes. Um, but I would even ask, why does a song have to be four minutes, four minutes and 20 seconds, four minutes and 32 seconds. Most songs are in the church. Are, why, why, why is that the standard? Um, so really when it comes to worship songs, it's not so it's not the length. It's the depth of the heart, heart engagement. Now you can just go too long. Okay. You know, that's, that's long enough. But if, if, if a worshiper is worshiping and the Holy spirit is worshiping, the Holy spirit's not in a hurry. The Holy spirit is not, um, on a time clock, he doesn't have a, his schedule's not being ruined. Um, there's a, there's a seeking God, there's a brokenness, there's a drawing close to God. And when you're truly worshiping, um, I, you don't have to stop at four minutes. Now, if there are people who go, okay, let's go 10 minutes, let's camp out. Maybe God will visit us. You know, that's not good either, but what you do in extended worship is you're providing an atmosphere for God to really move. I mean, I don't talk about much, but sometimes I have an hour and a half of just worship in the morning. I hit repeat, 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 repeat on the same song, just being being broken before God and preparing my sermons. And so uh, it's not that we have to do that. It's that the spirit inside wants to cry out a father. And, and, um, and you, yeah, you can say, you, you, like you said, you can say a quick prayer 
and God will be there. Absolutely. But I, I just don't understand the, um, you know, why a, a longer song or maybe 40 minutes of worship without any interruptions to me, that would be pretty, that would be thoroughly biblical. You know, if you read early church history, they would sing Psalms maybe for an hour and they would have the hymn, uh, not the hymns, but the, um, uh, like some instruments and, and just quite pray quietly and waiting on God. He who waits on me, uh, will renew their strength. Seek me. And that seeking is a diligence. It's a process. And so that's, that's what extended worship is about. It's not getting emotional. It's engaged in worship and you really don't want to stop. So, um, Hope that helps with all three of those questions. Definitely good ones. So thanks.